So we are recording. Here. Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a, a Mississippi Valley Conservancy linked to the land online Zoom presentation. And today our presentation is about preserving and enjoying dark skies. Um, my name is Sarah. I work in communications at Mississippi Valley Conservancy. I am joined today by Carol Abrahamson, our executive director. There she is waving. She's helping me out. And uh, we are very, very delighted to have two very good astronomers with us today. Mm -hmm. Linda Schweikert is an amateur astronomer with the Iowa County Astronomers Dark Sky. She's a dark sky warrior with the International Dark Sky Association. And she was recently named Dark Sky Ambassador with the International Astronomical Union. Uh, and I'll let her tell you a little more about herself when she starts. I also, um, following Linda will be John Heasley, who is, uh, he is an astronomy educator with Driftless Stargazing LLC, which has a wonderful Facebook page you should check out if you don't already have it, you should like that page, Driftless Stargazing, because you'll get lots of great tidbits on a regular basis. Um, he, John volunteers with NASA as a solar system ambassador, love it and with International Astronomical Union as a dark sky ambassador, just like Linda. So thank you both for joining us today. We are going to, uh, Linda is going to start and then John will immediately follow. And um, you may please feel welcome to enter questions at any time in the chat part of the Zoom screen. Uh, if you haven't used that before, it's just down at the bottom of your main screen. You'll see a little chat bubble, and then it'll pop up on the side of your screen. You can enter your questions there. If you have a question for clarification right in the middle of the presentation, but we'll keep an eye on it, and we'll try and field those questions as we go. But we will save most of the questions for the end, and we will kind of facilitate by sharing those questions with John and Linda as we go. So thanks again for being here and Linda, take it away. Well, thank you for inviting us today. Uh, John and I are always excited to talk about the night skies. Um, as she said, yeah, I'm a member of the Iowa County Astronomers. I am also a member of the International Astronomical Union as a dark sky ambassador. Uh, my day job is I'm the county conservationist for the Grant County uh, Conservation Sanitation Zoning Department. And my nighttime passion is enjoying the night skies. So, so I really um, thank you for being here, ha having us here, and I uh, look forward to hopefully, hopefully convincing you to shut off a light or two. And then afterwards, I will hand it off. If I do my job, um, I can convince you to turn off your lights. John will show you um, what you can see in the night sky. So um, <clears throat> normally, I do this in a, in a room full of people, and I ask everyone to raise their hand. Who turns their lights off when they go to bed? So of the people I can see on my screen, I'm seeing everyone raise their hand. Of course, right? I mean, that's just a no brainer. We turn our lights off when we go to bed. But why do we turn our lights off when we go to bed? Well, we as humans have evolved in a day night cycle with the sun up and then the sun turns off and then we sleep at night when the lights are off. Um, study after study has proven this is what we need. We need darkness at night. We don't need more sleep. We need more darkness. Um, we need to um, make our environments where we go to sleep a nice dark environment. And that's easy for us to do, right? I mean, if we've got this bright street light out in front of our house, we can just shut our blinds, we can shut our door, we can turn off our lights, and we can have darkness. So that's problem solved, humans. But as uh, probably the, the Conservancy knows, we have more than just humans outside um, experiencing the nighttime sky. And studies have shown that artificial light at night is adversely affecting our wildlife. And I'm just going to show you a handful of, of um, studies that have proven that this is um, adverse to our wildlife. And you can go to the Dark Sky Association. They have lots of research done on um, 
multitude of other animals around the world. These ones are probably more aptitude to, to the Midwest. Um, the first one is American toad. We've all probably seen that little toad around our house, uh, probably in the driveway getting bugs at night. Well, the study shows that toads that grow up in an urban area as opposed to toads out in a dark sky area are much smaller. Oops, sorry. Are much smaller. Um, they're growing smaller. And they think uh, being in this artificial dark light situation is adversely affecting um, the way they, they hunt their prey. Um, being a smaller animal, they don't have as much um, fat to hike over winter and hibernate. And so um, being a smaller uh, critter is adversely affecting them over the winters. They don't have enough to make it through the winter. So um, the urban artificial lights at night are, are affecting our little toads. Um, salmon, we don't have salmon here in the Midwest, but we all have fish and uh, artificial lights at night are adversely affecting the Pacific um, Coast salmon. When the salmon are little, like the fry, they're supposed to stay out in the deep waters where it's dark. And um, by doing so, then they can grow into adulthood. But what they're seeing is the lights of the shoreline um, are attracting the, the young fish into the shallow waters. Mm -hmm. And um, what they're seeing is the predators, the raccoons, the herons, the the um, other predators that come in in the shallow areas are being able to eat them a lot easier. And so therefore their populations are going down because they're being predated. Um, they're not supposed to be coming into the shallow areas. They're supposed to be staying out into the deep area. Um, I like to preface this by saying this is not a post about um, anti World Trade Center Memorial. Um, but the memorial itself has provided a lot of research um, on bird migration. Um, quite the study that was done um, when they had the, the, the tribute of light off and then the tribute of light on in New York. And when it was off, um, there was, they saw about 500 birds in the area. This was at 212. And then 20 minutes later, just, just 20 minutes, same day, 20 minutes later, 15,700 birds were drawn to the memorial. And what this is saying is that birds are artificially attracted to these beams of light, the cities, and it's pulling them off their migration routes. Obviously, they weren't there when the light was off. They were, they were migrating, they were going on their way. And then by the, the lights of the city, drawing them off of their migration routes slows them down we all know that the first bird that gets to the, you know, the field in the spring gets to get the best areas to nest. They get the best areas to hunt for their food. They're arriving there when their food arrives, when their food starts emerging from the soil. Um, and so by pulling birds off of their migration routes is uh, weakening them going forward into their, uh, into their springtime. Um, pollinators, I'm sure the, the Mississippi Valley Conservancy, a lot of your prairies are based on providing habitat for pollinators. 40% of pollination occurs at night. So we probably often think of the moths and the bugs that we see at night as nuisance, um, getting in our way when we're trying to enjoy the night sky. But 40% of the, po the pollination is a, is a big number. And normally, if we see a light out at night, what do we see flying around it? We see hundreds of bugs flying around that light. Well, that's not where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be in the fields on the flowers. And we like pollination, right? Because it provides us our fruit and our flowers and, and food that we like to eat. But the pollination is a byproduct of them actually feeding. So the bugs are supposed to be out there feeding on, on, on the flowers for their own survival. Um, what this study showed was when the lights were turned on, there was 62% less visits to the flowers once the lights were on. They were that attracted to the light. That they, and then pollination went down 13%. So the fruits that were pollinated by the, the um, insects they were studying, 13% decrease when there was lights on. So it's definitely adverse affecting our, our pollinators at night. And then lastly, I like to say that the firefly is the poster child for dark skies. Um, we all, who does not love seeing fireflies in the spring and summer? It just reminds you of chasing these, these bugs. But the light, it turns out, is not for our enjoyment. The light is how they communicate and how they reproduce. And so 
um, they did a study and they showed that um, fireflies in urban areas, light polluted areas, were flashing their light less often than in a, in a dark sky area, in an area without artificial light. And so if the fireflies are flashing less often, it means they're not communicating with each other and they're not finding each other for repro reproduction. And so therefore we are seeing that um, fireflies are going down. And while there's a multitude of um, other adverse effects on fireflies, um, light pollution is, is one of them that is contributing to their decrease. So going through all of that, you realize that you know dark skies are or darkness is good for humans and dark light skies are bad for uh, animals. So so now what? What do we do with this information? Um, I think we all we're kind of preaching to the choir today. We all enjoy the wildlife and the outdoors, and so you know, so so what? Um, now that we know that we do have dark skies in Wisconsin. I mean, I'm sure all of us have gone out and probably looked up and seen the seen the stars. So do we really have a problem here in, in Wisconsin? So there's this really neat map and I can show it afterwards if there's questions and I'll put this information in the chat. Um, lightpollutionmap.info and it shows all the light pollution around the world. And what you're looking at is gray areas, very dark, bright areas, very bright. Um, we're losing our dark skies at a rate of 2% a year and this actually may start to increase even faster because of LEDs. Um, because LED lights are so cheap and easy to like convert a whole city in just a month, um, they're putting in brighter lights because it, it's, le it's less expensive. And so now we're actually seeing the cities even get brighter, even though they're not adding additional lights, just converting the existing lights to LED could be even brightening up the sky even faster. We use this kind of um, scale to see um, what we can see in the dark skies. Um, an excellent dark sky. You can see all these beautiful stars. You can see the Milky Way. And as we all know, as we get into the city, we see less and less and less stars. For the United States, you can kind of see there's a line down the middle. Um, the Eastern United States is highly populated. Western United States is um, more open. So you can see there's darker skies out West. And as we zoom into Wisconsin, you can see that there's a large portion of Wisconsin that's inundated with uh, light pollution. However, Wisconsin's not a foregone conclusion. We do have some things that we can uh, hang our hat on. We do have an international dark sky park at Newport State Park in uh, Door County, uh, preserving the dark skies up there. And you can see Northern Wisconsin, we have some pretty dark skies in Northern and even Southwest Wisconsin, the city lights of the city still hasn't completely inundated our area. So um, we do have some hope. And that's why John and I do these talks is to get the information out there to see if we can stop the spread of light pollution and preserve our dark skies we have in Southwest Wisconsin. Um, here, since a lot of the Mississippi Valley Conservancy areas are in La Crosse, I kind of pulled in there and you, you can see La Crosse obviously is breaking into that white area, reds and orange. Um, we have a lot of light pollution around La Crosse, but if you go south, if you go east, you have the Nacito National Wildlife Refuge, you do have um, some areas not that far away um, that you can get out and enjoy the dark skies. But you can see every little city has their little light bubble. And uh, as cities get bigger and bigger, they get brighter and brighter. So not all doom and gloom. We like to have some, some positivity to the talk. So how can we remedy this situation? And as I said in the beginning, um, my, my position during the day is a conservationist and deal with surface water quality and Solving those issues is not an easy solution. It takes um, management changes and, and time and effort to, to see any progress with, with water quality. With light pollution, the solution is that simple. We can turn off the light. Our lights are not destroying the stars. The lights are cutting us off from our heritage to see the stars. And uh, this picture was taken during a blackout in 2003. And just to see the beauty that is over that house in this picture, you can see a dozen stars when all the lights of the city are on. And when the lights went out, the Milky Way was over their home. And so it's like, it's there, it's there for us to see. And the solution doesn't take years. It could take just the flip of a switch. I'm often told, but we can't turn off all the lights. We need the lights lined up. And I'm not asking you to turn off all the lights, um, but there are cities that do. 
Um, Arizona has the most aggressive dark sky lighting ordinances in the country, probably in the world. A lot of uh, um, telescopes, a lot of um, observatories in Arizona, so they have a lot of um, ordinances to protect their night, night sky. And there are um, cities, there is an actual city in Arizona that um, has no street light. No street lights. Can you imagine that? We can't live without street lights. And I often say, why do we need the street lights? The cars driving through have lights on them. If you were walking through at night, your eyes adjust to the darkness, you can see a car coming at you because it has its lights on it. And it's being done in the United States that they actually have turned off all the street lights in the city and are still um, going along quite fine. <clears throat> But people tell me that for safety reasons. For safety reasons, Linda, we need to have the lights on. And so there's been studies done um, on the, the security of adding more lights. And what they're actually seeing is with more lights, there's an increase in crime. Because with more lights, the criminals can see better. <laughs> and so they can see where they need to be. They can see where they need to go. What we actually promote is motion lights. So take your car dealership, right? All those cars with all those lights shining on all those shiny cars. And you've got the light on all night long. Well, if you had those on motion light and somebody was coming into the car lot, boom, lights shine on. That's going to get your attention, right? As opposed to just trying to see some movement in the already lit a parking lot. How about all of a sudden the light shines up, the security cameras go on, um, the decreased lighting or the the refined lighting, the better designed lighting is more secure than all night lighting. Here you can see um, this backyard is well lit with this bright, bright light shining up their backyard. Um, but is this really secure? Because if you see, we got this glare getting in our eyes. And if we shield that glare, there's actually a person standing there. Now you're probably saying, wait, 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 was he really in the last picture? So let me go backwards. <laughs> and yes, he is. He's standing there, but we don't see him because the glare gets in our eyes. And so we see the light, not what's around us. But if we can shield that light and place it down on the ground where we need to see, we're actually more secure. So if we cannot turn off all the lights, if I cannot convince you to do that, I hope that I can at least convince you that shielding the lights is better than anything. My biggest nemesis is the big round globes that shine 360 degrees, um, there is no reason to be shining light straight up in the sky. The only people that are seeing that are our astronauts in the International Space Station, which John will tell you about later. They don't need our light shining up. They have plenty of light up there that they can see and do what they need to do up there in the International Space Station. We do not need to be shining light straight up in the air. Um, putting the little baseball cap on is a little bit better, but we still have glare going up, shielding, this one is good because it's not going up into the sky, but we're still getting that glare. Remember the glare in the backyard where we couldn't see the gentleman. Um, that, that light's still getting in our so that we can't see you know, things on the ground. Fully shielding the light so that you don't see the light bulb below the light and shining on the ground where we need it to be is the best that we can do. Plus, we're not wasting um, electricity. We're not wasting energy. All of this is wasted energy. We're spending money on this that we're not using. Let's put the lights down on the ground where we need it to be. Um, I put my money where my mouth was. I do have this um, light out on the front of my house. Um, I don't use it because you'll see in a later picture, I have a very bright street light in my front yard, so I don't need to turn any lights on in my yard. Um, but I thought, well, if I'm promoting dark skies, I need to take that off my house. And I replaced it with a fully shielded light shining down. Um, I did it myself. Um, it took me about an hour, two hours on a Saturday afternoon. It's not something that, you know, you need to hire someone to do. It's, it's very easy to convert it out. And these can be bought in any of our home improvement stores um, around the area. Home Depot is a supporter of International Dark Skies. So I do like to put in a plug for Home Depot. Um, but it's easy easy to convert these, these uh, light polluting um, objects on our houses um, into something more appropriate. International uh, Dark Sky Association has a, a nice handout about you know which lights not to use, which lights to use. But basically, it's if you can see the light bulb coming out from under the fixture, it's light pollution. You want to find a fixture um, that the light bulb doesn't come out below. 
In addition to that, you can change the color temperature scale. Um, what we're seeing in the cities, like I said, how they're, they're making the lights brighter and brighter. They're, they're, they're installing lights that are um, higher and higher Kelvin color. It's, it's basically how we color our lights. Um, and brighter is better, right? We, we need to see more. So they're putting in these brighter colors. Um, when I tell people when they're going out to pick a, a dark sky friendly light, it's really easy to, to determine. You don't need to know what these numbers are. You just need to look at the color. And when we look at blue and, and white, think of daytime, right? What color is our sky when we're awake? The sky is blue, it's bright. It's, so the box, you just say, okay, this is for our inside, maybe for your kitchen, maybe for your living room where you need to read or in your office. Yeah, we want these bright lights um, so that we can see and stay awake. And then, at night, when the sun is setting, what colors do we see? We see the oranges and the yellows. So right there on the box, it tells you if you're putting something outside for nighttime, we wanna mimic what nature um, puts on the, the horizon for us when the sun sets, the oranges and the yellows. And lastly, um, you could always look into lighting ordinances if you feel strongly enough. Um, you don't have to recreate the wheel. Dark Sky Organization has uh, templates for ordinances um, ordinances and they've got experience um, doing these around the world uh, so they have a lot of um, help and advice um, for those looking forward to do um, actions. So in summary um, darkness is beneficial for humans and wildlife. Light pollution is increasing at a rate of two percent a year. Uh, simple solutions to preserve, to preserve the dark skies are turn, turn off lights that you don't need. If there's a light that you have on that you have on 24 hours or 12 hours do you need it? Ask yourself if you need it. Can you put it on a motion light um, so that you are alerted when the light comes on? Fully shielded. If you have to have a light on outside, please make sure that it's fully shielded so it's shining down and not glaring off onto the side or up, up into the sky. And change your color. All lights outside that are on at night should be, should be that orange or warmer color. And a complex solution is lighting ordinances. Um, together, we can save the night sky one light bulb at a time. If any of you do make a change, um, if you do change a, a light bulb on your house, whether it is just the, the color, if you go out there and change it from bright white to, to nice and yellow, if you post it on social media with the hashtag one light bulb at a time, then John and I will get to see it and then we will cheer from you from afar and say, yay, we made a difference. People are, are changing out their light bulbs. Um, I did it when I, you know, when I post, when I changed my lights, I posted it out there. Um, and then I also have, when I have to go someplace that has lots of lights, like this is my front yard. This is the street light in my front yard. And I use my shield when I want to go outside and look at the International Space Station. Um, it does make a difference just shielding the lights when you're going to look outside, um, saving the night sky one light bulb at a time. So I hope that um, I've piqued your interest on what you can do to make the dark skies darker. And now John is going to tell you what you can see if you do so. John, I think you're muted. Yep. How about now? Perfect. All right. So Linda, thanks for a really wonderful overview there on how we can preserve the dark skies. And I'll move on to the next part, which is how to enjoy the dark skies once we go through all the trouble of preserving them. And so this is Solstice sol Stargazing and really be happy to be spending some time with you here, here this morning. So there I am stargazing um, and that's at Governor Dodge State Park. And I want you to notice I'm on the left. There are no telescopes involved at all. I'm having a perfectly fine time just with my eyes. And that's another stargazer, Sue, to my right. And she brought along her birding binoculars. So you already have what you need to be, to be, a, star, to be a stargazer. And so, yeah, thanks for a good introduction. I'm John Hazley. I volunteer a couple of ways with NASA. And NASA would like me to remind you, I volunteer with them. I am not employed by NASA as a solar system ambassador. And they teach me a lot about what's going on with solar system exploration. And then I get to share that with people in the, in the area. And like Linda, I'm also very happy to volunteer with International Astronomical Union as a dark sky ambassador, just promoting the enjoyment of 
of Dark Skies. And then my side gig is a business called Driftless Stargazing. Uh, I do astronomy education and share the starry skies. I work with libraries, schools, groups. I especially like working with groups such as Mississippi Valley Conservancy, Driftless Area Land Conservation, uh, Kickapoo Valley Reserve, Friends of the Lower Wisconsin, because that audience, people are already enjoying the outdoors. I'm just adding one more thing to their experience of the outdoors. And you can find me on Facebook once or twice a day. I try to tell you cool things that are happening up in the sky. So if you do Facebook, go ahead, give it, give it a like, and I will try to tell you amazing things that are happening in the nighttime sky. As Linda knows, I am incredibly fond of this quote by uh, Baba Diom from Senegal, who is a forester. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. We will understand only what we are taught. And I just love how that brings together love and conservation and teaching. And just as a side note, Linda and I, we've done this talk before and we go back and forth on who goes first. Like, do you talk about the dark skies first and then how to enjoy them? Or do you go the other way of talk about enjoying them and getting people to love the skies and then working? And I don't think we've come up with a preference for which way works better because they certainly all go with, they certainly all go with one another. But that's the takeaway for today. I want you to love the night sky and when you do, I think you'll be better prepared, better motivated to preserve them. So how to see, yeah, I do actually own a telescope, a couple of telescopes, and you can use those to enjoy the nighttime sky. But a lot of nights, as I said, I just go out with my eyes. Being a stargazer is incredibly easy to do. Go outside, look up. Congratulations, mission accomplished. You are now officially a stargazer. It helps a lot to get away from light pollution, get away from the town, get away from the city. And with Sarah and Carol, we could talk about some other areas you can go to, but in general, state parks, county parks are wonderful. Preserve areas, such as the areas being protected by MVC, check those out for nighttime observatory. And I've kind of discovered that cemeteries are a good spot too for nighttime observing. They're publicly accessible and got a lot of lights there. Our eyes are really good at seeing in the dark, but you gotta give them a chance. It takes 15, 20 minutes to get dark adapted. Totally love my cell phone, but I learned to keep that away when I'm outside so that I can enjoy it. And if you do need a little light, red light is the best. It's winter time in Wisconsin, so bundle up out there, dress warmly, layers, you know the drill, you're outdoors people. Uh, bring your healthy snacks, warm beverage. Looking up is hard on our necks. Bring your chair, bring a blanket, bring an inflatable mattress. You'll enjoy it more if you're comfortable, you'll be outside more. As I mentioned, love binoculars or spotting scope, not to make any predictions about the demographics of this group, but I think a lot of you already have binoculars and spotting scopes, you can use those for stargazing because as you've discovered, they make our eyes a lot bigger. And after we dark adapt, we're letting more light into our eyes and we can magnify things a little bit as, as well. So use what you have. You've got eyes, got binoculars, you got spotting scopes, enjoy using those. So today I wanna to share three events with you that are coming up as we transition from fall to summer. One is we're making this transition with the winter solstice. That's gonna be happening Monday. If you want to set an alarm, it's officially at 4.02 a.m. Central Standard Time. And some things to notice this time of year. Back in the summer, the sun was traveling high up in the sky and we had these really, really short shadows. By wintertime, the sun is traveling much lower in the sky for a shorter period, and we get those really long shadows. And the colors of the sky change. Summertime is more blue, white up in the sky. Wintertime, 
you know, it's that golden hour. We get those golds and yellows for much of the much of the day. So notice that as the sun is taking the low path across the sky. I think of solstice as the time of year when time stands still, when time slows down. That's the view of solstice last winter, and it's taken at Franks Hill, uh, where the effigy mounds are in Richland County, just outside of Muscaday. And the sun is setting way there in the Southwest. That's a place I go to a lot for the equinoxes and solstices. On the equinox, it sets due west along Highway 60 on your way to Boscobel and Wazika. Mm -hmm. And when you go there in the summertime, you're off the map because then it's setting in the Northwest. I've also learned that sunsets are a little bit slower on the solstice because the sun is setting at an angle you get an extra 30 seconds of sunset for the sun to dip below the horizon. And also, if you notice in December, there's not much difference in time between sunrise, the time of sunrise and the time of sunset. It varies about 10 minutes because the time is slowing down. And I think that's to be respected and appreciated and honored. And in my former life, I was an English teacher and I worked for a dictionary for a time. And so I know that solstice literally means it's when the sun stands still. If you're looking at sunrise, sunset right now, there's not much of a difference of day to day when that changes. So yeah, enjoy that. Things are always better when we explain them astronomically a little bit. And so, yeah, one cool thing about planet Earth is we're tilted on our axis. Yeah, life would be simpler if we didn't have that axial tilt, but life is a lot more interesting because we do. And so there we are on the winter solstice. Our axis is pointed away from the sun. So up here in the Northern hemisphere, we spend a lot more time in the shadow of the earth, in darkness. If you've got friends down the Southern hemisphere in Africa or Australia or South America, they're having summer right now. But here in Wisconsin, we're down to nine hours of sunlight. We had 15 hours of sunlight back in June. We've got three hours of in-between time, the twilight when the stars are just starting to emerge. And then we've got 12 hours when the sky is fully dark. And that was flipped back in the time of the summer, of the summer solstice. There is another view astronomically, uh, instead of tilting the earth, how about we just tilt our path around the sun? And there we are in the December solstice, the winter solstice, and we're kind of above the sun, if that helps you to imagine. And so the sun is shining more in the Southern hemisphere, whereas in the summer, we're over here and we're in the sunshine a lot more. So different ways to picture it, different ways to imagine it. There is an incredibly cool event happening right now in the days around the solstice. And maybe you've heard about this if you're following on the news or social media. It's called the Great Conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. And it's happening prime time this weekend, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So we're hoping for a clear day on one of those three. And it's when Saturn and Jupiter align in the sky. And it is super easy to see. I've been enjoying it all fall. I was out on Thursday when we had clear skies. Go out around five o'clock. That's about a half hour after sunset. If you've got good eyes, go out at 445. Look southwest. Take your hand, be the Fonz, do a thumbs up. <laughs> That's about 15 degrees. Between the bottom of your hand and the tip of your finger, put the bottom of your hand on the horizon, Jupiter will be about that high up. It is the first, air quotes, star you see in the nighttime sky. And then look for Saturn, will be very, very close by it. This is cool because this only happens once every 20 years. And when it happened back in 2000, it was happening close to the sun. We really didn't get to see it. Last time it happened, this close and easily seen, that was back in March of 1226. Wow. 
Francis of Assisi was still alive, Genghis Khan was still doing his thing in Central Asia. That's how long ago it's, it's been. And it won't be this close again until 2080. So those of you who are millennials, Gen Z, see it this time and you will see it again in 2080. So I've got a mission for you, travel to the future, see it in 2080, tell the folks there we said hi, and boy, I hope they remember us as good ancestors. So you get to see it a couple of times. And this I just found from the Astronomical League. Yeah, you can use your finger. Back earlier in the month or back in November, you could hold your finger out and they were about two, oops, they were about two degrees, one finger apart. Now they're about the width of a dime turned on its side apart. That's how close together they are. Something else, the third thing you can enjoy yet this month, we get a full moon, officially full on December 29th, but we like to make it a three day event. And it's called the full cold moon, long night moon, yule moon, yule moon, take your name, take your pick. The full moon rises and sets opposite the sun. So the one is setting in the Southwest, the moon will be rising in the Northeast. And it's the northernmost point of moonrise for the year. This is at Peck's Landing, uh, just south of Spring Green, the lower Wisconsin River. And this was the full moon back in October. When I went back there in November, the full moon was rising over here. When I go back later this week, I hope, I expect, not hope, I expect, I know I'll be looking for the full moon rising even further to the north. If you want to impress your friends, go out at sunset, look at your shadow, turn your back to the sun, look at the sun setting. Your shadow will point the way to where the moon is going to rise. Ooh. And people think it's magic, but it's just, it's just science. This full moon is opposite the sun. Sun's up in the sky for nine hours. This moon is gonna be up in the sun. I'm sorry, we'll be up in the sky for 15 hours and high up in the sky. So get out there and enjoy that. Let me go back one. People are always watching the sunset. I encourage you to turn your back on the setting sun and watch what's happening in the Eastern sky. Along the horizon there, you can see the sky getting dark. That's Earth's shadow. Earth is casting a shadow and you're watching it rise. And I always like to tell people, night doesn't fall, it rises. <laughs> and then you see a little pinkish band above there. And there's a photo by my good friend, Elaine Hendricks. I know she's here this morning. Uh, also taken on Lower Wisconsin Riverway. You get that pinkish band, which is known as the belt of Venus. And if you were up that high in the atmosphere, you could still see the setting sun. And that's why you get that pinkish glow right there. Encourage people to go out. There is this wonderful children's book by ornithologist, Wisconsin, Francis Hammerstrom called Walk When the Moon is Full. And I encourage you to do that. Just enjoy that twilight world and see what's happening up in the sky. Uh, Got some good websites to share with you, but we can pull those up maybe during questions and answer, but I'm really a fan of Earth Sky Tonight, and you can get a free map every month of the sky by Sky Maps. And check out your local astronomy clubs in La Crosse, Wyalusing, and Iowa County astronomers, and especially when people are meeting together, that's a way to learn more. Looking ahead to 2021, we've got some lunar eclipses happening, and then some more in 2022 some partial solar eclipses, but put on your calendar, you get to see a total solar eclipse if you're willing to travel, uh, just three and a half years away. And if you're waiting for one to come to the Driftless area, that's 14 September, 2099. And I can see some of you, yay, will get a chance to see that. Could you watch that for me and just say, wow. And again, tell the folks we said hi, and we hope they're all doing well in 2099. Stargazing, great hobby, inexpensive, 
it's a total experience being out there tonight. I like how we can look back in time and connect with what humans have been doing for a long time. And then I'll just leave you with a plug. Yep, check out my Facebook page, Driftless, Driftless Stargazing. And I really appreciate you considering dark skies. And I went over a little bit, so let me stop there. And you've been great about listening. And Lynn and I would be real happy to take any questions you might, any questions you might have. Hey, thanks. Thanks to both of you. That was fantastic. I can't wait to go outside tonight. Mission English. Thank you. <laughs> if anyone has additional questions, please let us know. Can I, I can't find the chat button. Can I just ask a question? Sure, <laughs> go, go ahead, Lori. Sure. So um, one, I think this is probably for John. Um, some are there are there some good meteor showers that are coming up um, in winter and and maybe early spring that we might keep an eye out for because I think that's always an interesting thing. There was a good one last week, the Geminids, and I bundled up and we had some clear skies and I watched those from my driveway. And there is one coming up in early January. Looks like, oh, it's a weekend, sweet. January 2nd and 3rd, the quadrant, quadranted meteor showers. Uh, that's Saturday, Sunday night, first weekend of the new year. Go out, bundle up. A lot of people don't see it because it's cold, but it's one of the better showers of the year. So yeah, check that out. Thanks, Lori. John, we have a question. How often do solar eclipses happen? Uh, should look that up on Wikipedia, but I'm gonna punt a little bit and say, seems they happen about once a year in kind of complicated, complicated cycles but not necessarily in the United States. So solar, right. like we just had a solar eclipse um, in South America, was it last week? Right, and that's the thing. If you want to see totality, that involves some traveling, but do it if you can. It is a wow experience. I see some of you nodding your head. So I'm already looking ahead to that one in 2024 and trying to think, do I want to watch it from Illinois or Arkansas or Texas? and don't know yet, but the one we saw in 2017 in Nebraska was one of the better experiences of my life. We have uh, another question. Um, we have someone asking about how the conjunction relates to the dawning of the age of Aquarius, which kind of raises <laughs> a bunch of questions about the relationship between astronomy and astrology. You want that one, Linda? <laughs> um, we're astronomers, not astrologers. Um, my family often calls me an astrologist. I'm like, no, I'm into astronomy, not astrology. So that one you would have to look up on Facebook or on the internet. And for me, I'm just happy enough looking up into the natural world. That is just awesome enough for me. So I don't want to make any claims, any claims beyond that. And Ellen has her hand. Oh, go ahead and finish. Uh, Dave, I was going to say something on the tail of John's presentation. You know, a lot of times people are intimidated to, to, to get into astronomy because they don't have a telescope. And my favorite thing to do, I do have a telescope and I do pull it out, but my favorite thing to do is lay down on the ground with kids um, or teenagers and look up and just say, what do you see? What do you see? Make your own shapes. You don't need to know the constellations. Um, make your own constellations and, you know, just enjoy what you can see up there. And those are probably my most memorable times looking up. And David, you have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, one thing, if you could c clarify, John, you said the, the January, um, but, but I did the meteors, but I don't recognize that name. It, um, and I watch the sky quite a bit. So could you say what constellations those are part of? 
<laughs> Thank you for asking that. And you are totally right. Uh, nowadays, we have 88 official constellations declared by the, defined by the International Astronomical Union. The quadrantids are named for a former constellation. The stars are still there, but we, it's no longer an officially recognized the constellation. Um, what I've learned is that as you go around the world, there are all kinds of traditions and different ways of seeing the stars in the sky. So those 88 official ones, those are the from the Mediterranean world. They're one way of looking at the world. But I like to do what Linda does of just tell people to, to look up. And Nancy, the part of your question, I would need to look that up. I forget where the stars are, what constellation those stars are in now. But for meteor showers, it doesn't matter so much because they show up in any part of the sky. They just originate from that constellation. So the yeah, Geminids, yeah. they all start in the Geminids. But when I was watching them last week, there was a tree blocking Gemini when I was outside. But that didn't matter because I had a nice area above me and I got to lie down and just watch those. So thanks for asking. I noticed that uh, most of what I saw was more in Orion than in Gemini. Um, but my other question is, I was watching Jupiter and Saturn all summer. Yes. They, I was trying to tell whether they were getting closer or further apart, and it was very hard to tell. And then all of a sudden here towards the end of the year, there seems to be moving faster. And I was wondering if like Jupiter is going retrograde or why, Am I right that it seems like they're getting closer together faster than they were for all those months in the summer? I would need to check on that about them being retrograde, but I'm thinking not. Right now, I think they're approaching each other at the same, at the same rate. I think it's, I've had the same experience. I think it's just become more noticeable as they get closer together. And it really is a lesson in patience because Saturn takes 30 years to go around the sun. Jupiter takes 12 years. And so these are just very, very slow events. And like I said, it's 20 years between them. So it's a generational thing. Thank you. Thanks for asking, so, good questions. This is Ron. I just wanted to interject, John, that, um, that Radiant is northeast towards the Little Dipper or between the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper. I just looked it up. Ron, fellow member of Iowa County Astronomers, thanks for the assistance looking it up, Ron. Appreciate it. We have someone asking, what can we do about neighbors and businesses who are like polluters? For example, a big gas station convenience store in Westby. So the number one thing you can do is communicate with them. Now, if they're a chain, um, a lot of times their lighting is set by the, by the head company. Um, but what I've been finding is just getting information and uh, communication out there um, so that when they make, go to make new changes, they have this information already in the back of their mind. I'm not saying that they will make changes. Um, but at least if they know that there's an option, I think a lot of people aren't even aware that the light that they have on is adversely affecting something else. Because we've grown up under light polluted skies and we haven't, if people haven't been exposed to the awe and wonder of the Milky Way or what, you know, what it can be seen out there, they don't think to protect it. With neighbors, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, because we all know about neighborhood politics, but in, um, the International Dark Sky Association does have letters that you, that have, that you can kind of um, present to your neighbor, kind of explaining, you know, if you don't feel like you have the knowledge of what to say, they have a draft letter that you can present to your neighbor. What I have found works best is inviting them to come over and look through your telescope. And then when their lights are blocking the sky, they're like, oh, wow, that light is really bright. You know, have them experience it for themselves. Um, and then changes can be made that way. But it is, it is very slow. Um, 
um, education and information is, is your best course and not to go over angrily. If you go over, you know, upset and saying you have to change your lights, they're not going to listen. But if you go in um, kindly and try to explain to them why you would like the lights to, to change, um, but it is a slow process. Thank you both of you so much. Um, I, I want to uh, just thank everyone for coming today. We're, we are running out of time, so we're going to wrap up now. And um, I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank, uh, I see a lot of members and volunteers and want to especially thank you because um, without you, our, our uh, outreach programming and our land conservation would not be possible. Um, and Anyone can get involved with Mississippi Valley Conservancy by visiting our website. Um, we have a free twice a month e-news you can sign up for at the bottom of our website. Also at the top of our website, there's a nature preserves button where you can pop out uh, a map of where all the nature preserves are. Many of them are very dark. A couple of them that we thought are especially good for nighttime access and open skies are Tunnelville Cliffs near Viola, um, Sugar Creek Bluff near Ferryville, uh, Bora Creek uh, Nature Preserve, which is in uh, Grant County. And uh, there are many, many dark sky locations in the Driftless area and some of the resources that uh, Linda and John have mentioned will help you find more of them as well. Oh, are you sharing your screen, Linda? Yep, I'm showing them your, your <laughs> reserve. Great, that's a map of all the nature preserves that our members have helped us to protect over 20 plus years. And uh, there are maps and hiking brochures and directions to all of them uh, when you visit our website under nature preserves. So thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Thanks everyone. Um, Sarah? Yes. Uh, as we're closing, may I offer just a short closing poem for the solstice? It's about one minute. Please do, yes. Okay. Uh, so my former life, I was an English teacher at Richmond Center High School and other places. So a chance to work in a poem. And I'd like to end with this as kind of a solstice gift to you. And this is called The Shortest Day and it's by Susan Cooper. And maybe you know this already. And so the shortest day came and the year died. And everywhere down the centuries of the snow white world came people singing, dancing to drive the dark away. They lighted candles in the winter trees. They hung their homes with evergreen. They burned beseeching fires all night long to keep the year alive. And when the New Year's sunshine blazed awake, they shouted, reveling. Through all the frosty ages, you can hear them echoing behind us. Listen, all the long echoes sing the same delight. This shortest day as promise wakens in the sleeping land. They carol, feast, give thanks and dearly love their friends and hope for peace. And now, so do we, here, now, this year, and every year. That's The Shortest Day by Susan Cooper, and happy solstice. Thank you, John and Linda. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Happy stargazing, everyone. Happy solstice.